afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm still waiting for people to join, and I know that the current stages of load shedding have made it quite challenging from different locations. Um, so we understand people's internet connections are sometimes unpredictable. I'd like to welcome uh, all of you, our uh, attendees and our panelists, to this afternoon's webinar. It's an uh, initiative of the Wits Justice Project, which is part of the Wits Center for Journalism. My name is Nahama Brody, and I'm the head of the Justice Project. And this is really um, an important issue, something that's incredibly important to me as a journalist and as a researcher, and something I've been wanting to look at for most of this year, which is every year around the time the president makes his budget speech, we have a flurry of interest around budgets. And then we don't seem to talk about budgets except for the financial press. We don't seem to talk about budgets for another 11 months until it's budget season again. And I really believe that it's it's critically important that as citizens um, and as participants in our society, we have an improved understanding of how our money is spent it's very, very easy to complain when we see something going wrong, but we need to take a proactive interest in where the money goes, how it's allocated, which departments are performing well and which departments are performing less well, shall we say. Um, uh, under the mandate of this justice project, we're really trying to encourage a growth in public interest justice journalism. So journalism that explains the justice system and helps to make it more accessible for everyone living in South Africa. And that encompasses the entire gamut of the justice system, not only criminal justice, but or looking at um, policing, looking at all types of courts, and of course, looking at the prison system. So this afternoon, we're going to be taking a look um, at the budgets for three different departments. That's the uh, Department of Justice and Constitution institutional development, it's the um, uh, Department of Policing, and it's the, sorry, the Ministry of Justice and Constitutional Development, Department of Policing, and the Department of Correctional Services. And to really kind of make this conversation come alive, I'm extremely uh, honoured, really, to um, have as our guests two very distinguished and lovely members of Parliament. I don't know if those two words always go together, but in this case, they very definitely do. Um, Paula and Paula from the ANC and Glynis Breitenbach from the DA. So thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. And I know that also you're taking time off or running in between the ongoing plenary session. Also joining us as a panelist is David Bruce. He's from the Institute for Security Studies. And David is an expert scholar um, and advisor in terms of security and justice justice issues. And uh, even more delightedly, I welcome our host for this afternoon, Kaya Setole. Kaya is, you know, a great mind, um, really insightful in so many issues, but also an accountant, which always surprises me. So um, not that accountants can't have great minds, um, but just that they're not always so engaging. Um, so I'm I'm really happy that Kaya agreed to come and facilitate the discussion this afternoon. I'm going to hand things over to Kaya. We will conclude with a, a Q and A at the end. I also have some questions from some of our students at the Bit Center for Journalism, which I'll share a little bit later. But Kaya is going to guide the discussion this afternoon. If you have questions that you'd like Kaya to ask the panel, you can post them using the um, the sort of chat function. I think we um, oh no, there's a raise hand function. There should be a chat function as well. Um, if you can just share it via chat and I will pass it on to Kaya and to the panel. So with that, um, thank you again all for joining us. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, so just to say for everybody who's attending and everybody who registered to attend, we will be sharing in the next week or so once it's corrected and finalized a budget toolkit, which will include summary information about the different budgets that we're discussing today. And the idea is that we're trying to make this information more accessible um, and hopefully uh, that those departments departments are more accountable. Right, over to you, Kaya. All right, no, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brody, uh, for that, and welcome to everyone. I think the importance of today's conversation is that it really, for me, seeks to bridge the information gap that exists between the citizens and, of course, the lawmaking process, where far too many of us do not really understand how the whole um, you know, uh, institutional framework fits into each other and what it really means when we hear the numbers being banded about and how it is that accountability is then enforced in relation to that. So I'm very excited that our three panelists have got deep experience in really understanding the unique mechanics of the justice and security cluster, um, experience in the lawmaking process, experience in the oversight process, and also experience in really understanding how the public interacts with some of these critical conversations. 
I think it also forms a, an important part of ensuring that in holding those that are elected accountable, we do so from a point of deep insights and deep knowledge. And I think I'm very grateful to that School of Journalism for putting together a conversation of this nature together. Now, of course, as uh, Nehama said, I'm an accountant, so I'm always fascinated by what politicians do. I don't know if I'm tempted to join them, but in the interim, I'd like to hear and find out exactly how they do their work and what it, it all entails. Dennis, I'd like to start with you here first and sort of just give us a very broad perspective on the justice and security cluster. What institutions make it up? Where do these institutions report to? What type of autonomy do they have? When we talk about the justice and security cluster, what is this animal that we have in mind? Um, hi, Nakaya, and hello to everybody. Um, so there's a, a really broad uh, gamut of, of institutions. The security cluster uh, consists of the um, Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. Uh, Correctional Services, uh, South African Police Services, uh, and then the Intelligence Services, uh, such as they are. Uh, so, so that's that's broadly the, the the institutions that that fall under the security cluster. Um, but for purposes of oversight, for purposes of of committee uh, oversight and, and dealing with budgets, um, the, the State Security Agency reports to a different committee. Uh, it's a closed committee for obvious reasons, and, and we have, uh, Kola and I have nothing to do with that. So um, our committee deals with, within the security cluster, deals with the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, uh, Correctional Services, and then all of the of the subsidiary, if you will, uh, departments that report upwards to those. So um, it has also has nothing to do with, with policing. Policing is a different committee with different members. Uh, and we're not members of the policing committee, although I'm sure Kola has as um, has in-depth knowledge of the police as I have, uh, which is uh, you know quite substantial because of my background as a prosecutor. Um, for the Department of Justice, you have uh, the the judiciary falls under that, both the lower courts and the higher courts. Um, you have the all the Chapter Nine institutions reporting to the committee of information regulator. Um, so it's a, it's a big. The Justice Committee is a really big and busy committee that has many different uh, functions and different facets uh, reporting to it. Uh, so, but within the security cluster, we're not responsible for, uh, strictly speaking, police. Although we do sometimes have joint sittings, and we have um, nothing at all to do with with state security because they report to the um, to the to the closed committee, um, uh, which has different members and 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 has a reporting line elsewhere. So broadly, that's that's uh, that's what we do. We. The, 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 the Justice Committee in Parliament uh, has oversight over uh, all of those uh, institutions that I've mentioned, the, the actual Department of Justice, the National Prosecuting Authority, uh, the Public Protector, the Information Regulator, the Human Rights Commission. Well, help me if I'm forgetting something. Um, of course, Correctional Services uh, and all of the Correctional Services are just massive. Uh, and so all of the, the different facets of correctional services. Uh, and, of course, correctional services has its own deputy minister. Um, yeah. Deputy <clears throat> Minister Palomisa is for correctional services, while deputy minister Jeffrey is for justice, although the minister has an overarching responsibility for both. Mm. Uh, police feed into the justice uh, committee in the sense that um, the criminal justice system as a whole uh, can't function without all its components, and all of the components include the police. Uh, so we we often the work overlaps, often information overlaps, often requirements overlap, um, and sometimes we manage to get a joint sitting. It would be ideal to have more joint sittings, but because of the very very busy program, it's very hard to do. Yeah. 
No, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Dennis. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I want to come to you at this particular point. Uh, Clinis has given us this big perspective of how of the institutions that are in this particular structure and also the different reporting lines. And I think one question that naturally emerges um, is whether there's multiple reporting lines with perhaps the obvious exception of the state security agencies. Do those multiple reporting lines enable us to have a comprehensive overview of the state of justice and, you know, policing at any point? Or is the model of saying that the police, for example, must report elsewhere with the exception of joint sittings um, and everybody else reports elsewhere? Is that the ideal model or do we need oversight body that can tell us conclusively? Uh, Kaya, you have been well, are you there? I, I think your network, I'm not sure if yeah. it's mine or you have been kicking. Uh, I think it's I think it's Kaya. Sorry, okay. Kaya, you're a bit. Can you hear general. me now? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you, and I think I think I've I've I've, I've tried to grasp. Uh, can the, you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes. So if you can just sort of give us some insights onto your views on the current reporting mechanism, do we need a more comprehensive one or are occasional joint sittings the answer to that? No, I, I think uh, as Advocate Britton Bach was saying, uh, the, the Justice Department has got a lot of uh, entities or organs within it. A lot of them, uh, including uh, Chapter 9 institutions, except only the Auditor General. Uh, it has got a lot, SIU, uh, Human Rights Commission, and a lot of them. It's, it's a very broad and a very big uh, uh, department of, uh, of government. And she is correct to say some of them, including police, SSA, and, and others, are reporting in different portfolio committees, not in the Justice uh, and Correctional Services Portfolio Committee. I think it is, a, it is, it is still a workable uh, system and a workable way of uh, making the executive to account. Uh, of course, there is collaboration uh, in particular on issues of mutual interest in between uh, all these portfolio committees. And uh, uh, remember, each and every uh, report must be tabled in the House, and uh, that's where all of us do partake uh, in the debate on, on every committee report. Uh, so so from where I'm seated, uh, I think it's a, it's a we can't, we, we, we are, we are, we are having a bloated program already with justice and correctional services. So you can't afford to have more work added to that. I think uh, part of uh, when we have time, part of what we must discuss, uh, particularly in the in this public uh, domain, is uh, uh, could it be that uh, we made a very progressive and efficient decision to uh, join correctional services and justice? Was they, there is a lot of work in both. As Advocate Bredenbach was saying, uh, we have a lot to a uh, uh, lot of issues, including the master's office that has got its own problems, a state attorney, and all that. But you still have to go and uh, deal with the likes of Tabo Besta in correctional services. So, so it, 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 it's it, it's already a lot of work on our shoulders, and we are just about eleven. I think uh, Advocate Bredenbach, I think uh, I'm correct. It's about uh, just about eleven. And in that 11, we have established a subcommittee on, on correctional services. So mm. it tells you the, 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 the magnitude of work that we have. But I think it's a workable situation that we can still strive to improve and ensure that uh, accountability in all these things is not missed. Yeah. No, I want to come back to the questions of the accountability instruments that exist, because I think for a lot of citizens, they may watch a couple of parliamentary sessions and see interrogations and questions and answers and not really know where it all fits in into the bigger architecture. And perhaps in cases like Tabo Besta, where the public interest is much more amplified, we lose opportunity because it gives the impression that the committee is only engaged in matters of that great chaos rather than, you know, ordinary ongoing accountability business. So I'd like to deliberate on that more. But before then, David Bruce, I'd like to bring you in here. I mean, you would have seen different case studies of how these structures are put together in other countries and other jurisdictions. South Africa's model, is it the right model that balances the, the need to make sure that we have a comprehensive view 
of what the justice and security uh, cluster is, is doing, but also having these multiple reporting lines. I think one of the issues that Ola just raised is new question of capacity. The volumes may just be the reason we have to have multiple structures. What's your view? Right. Well, um, I think that what, what, what I would say, I mean, I, you, I mean, there's obviously seriously dysfunctional aspects to the way in which the system's operating at the moment. Um, if one looks at the overall problem of crime in its various manifestations, um, it's obviously um, not something that is being effectively regulated or managed at the moment. So, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not quite sure if the primary focus here is on the role of, of Parliament. I wasn't quite clear about that. But but I, I think what, what, where we need to start with, I mean, I think, you know, potentially Parliament can play a meaningful role if there is uh, coherent political leadership being provided. In the absence of coherent political leadership, from from the cabinet, from the executive, um, you know, I don't think uh, it's really possible for Parliament to kind of step in and kind of compensate for the deficiencies of political leadership. And so, you know, cumulatively, if we're talking about the the, the kind of system of um, you know oversight of the of, for instance, I mean, my you know, to be quite honest, my work has almost exclusively focused on the police. With you know, sometimes. On occasions, I've ventured into issues to do with the prosecuting authority or or the functioning of the courts and so on. But um, you know, right at the moment, you know, the the, the 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 problem starts with the fact that there isn't actually that type of, um, particularly, I think, in the policing context, there isn't there isn't what you know there isn't coherent political leadership being provided in relation to policing. And so, um, considering the you know the daunting nature of the challenges in the overall criminal justice system, you know, and including those in the, on the policing terrain, then um, you know, I would um, you know, if I was to start um, trying to to strengthen or improve the system, it would certainly be you know within the executive, um, particularly on the policing level, rather than um, trying to kind of start reorganizing. The parliamentary oversight system. All right. So, thank you very much for that, David. Uh, I think we've lost you there. Is still there? Yes, I'm. I'm still here. Oh, no, I thought we had lost you there for a moment. No, we're going to come back to you, Glennis. Um, I want to bring this conversation back to you now, and also, obviously, one of the difficulties that citizens sometimes tend to struggle with is to understand the relationship between the executive and, and government. And I think in this context, it's always a matter of, but exactly who's responsible for what. So from a layman's understanding, the executive are the ones that say, look, these are the departments that are necessary in order to deliver on these particular national imperatives. And as soon as those departments are put together, parliament then says, okay, you guys must come and account here. And in order to account, this is what you need to be able to provide. What exactly are the instruments of accountability that Parliament has in place, particularly for this cluster? Is it simply a matter of periodically saying this is our plan of action and this is how we're going then? What, what, what are those information exchanges and what's their frequency? Um, yeah, look, Kaya, the, this, this, the, the, uh, the system is far from, from perfect. Um, I, I listened carefully to Ngola and he, he corrects the correctly sets out that, that the system kind of works, but it it really does limp along. And I, I agree with David that the place to start reorganizing is in the executive. Um, what parliamentary portfolio committees cannot do the job of the executive, no matter how hard we try to exercise effective oversight. Uh, it can't be done in the absence of, of proper political leadership. Um, having said that, uh, the various departments come to the portfolio committee on a, on a very regular basis or when required. So th there's a program worked out. They come at least once a term, often more. But when, when, a, when an urgent matter arises, uh, the committee does, can and has and does, uh, request them to come to the committee and, and report on that particular 
subject matter if it's a, if it's such a pressing issue. Um, the committee has quite a lot of um, authority to to ask uh, or request or in fact summon uh, people to come and, and 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 present to the committee on on any subject matter really that that we uh, feel the need to be informed upon. Um, and we we can ask for written submissions. We can ask for uh, in person sessions. We can ask for oral submissions. Um, and we can we can you know we we hold them to account when 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 we've asked them to do something. Uh, for instance, the um, let's take for example the 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 Tower Bester thing. Uh, when when that thing broke, um, you know, for the first time, uh, the the committee summoned the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Police, and the Commissioner of Correctional Services to one meeting where oversight was held over them. And I think it was done quite effectively. Yeah. That, 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 that saga is not over. They have to come again. Uh, as Nola pointed out, we're a very, very busy committee. Time is a, is a big, big, big problem. We could, we could do a lot more work if we had a lot more time. Um, but time is a big problem because, of course, we have a massive legislative program as well, which is insufferably time consuming. Mm. Uh, so, so, but, but we can do and have uh, summoned people for oversight. They call the National Prosecuting Authority to deal with a particular issue. Um, for instance, um, you know, gender based violence matters, not getting enough attention. We ask them a series of questions, they have to report back. And we hold them accountable to to the, the to their the, their promised progress. Uh, state capture matters; it's an ongoing uh, bone of contention. Um, the matters are not are, are not you know being brought to court at the speed that we expect. Uh, we 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 continuously call them and ask them for updates. We're not always satisfied. We sometimes send them away with a flea in the ear. Um, but but we do you know records are kept. The the, the committee has a lot of. Uh, administrative support, and I must say, our administrative support in the committee is outstanding, and uh, and so we we kept up to date. Um, all of those uh, minutes are available, and so next time we see them, we don't start anew; we carry on from where we left off. And and this committee in this parliament, I must say, uh, and for fear of giving Nola a big head, um, I'm a bigger head. I must say that <laughs> that uh, this committee really works exceptionally well. Um, we all like each other, which helps. We all get along with each other. It's a it's a non-partisan thing, a, a portfolio committee. It's a it's a it's a it's a tool, it's an instrument that um, sees to the interests of South African citizens. And so it's it's not a party political bickering. I must say, in the last parliament, that's what it was um, with uh, Matoli Mutecha as the chair. It was a completely and utterly dysfunctional, disastrous, horrible committee. Our current chairperson is is a, a gentleman called Budalani Magwaniche. What a wonderful man! Works like a demon. Works harder than any of us. Uh, runs that committee on an absolutely non-partisan basis, and is completely fair, objective, and his only interest is getting the job done. So this committee really works. All of us, all the parties, uh, get along. We all work together. We there, there's no bickering. There's no. Um, uh, one upmanship, there's no cheap political point scoring. We really do work well together, and, and that has made this committee exceptionally effective. I think it's probably one of the most hardworking and one of the most effective committees in Parliament. So, so for that, you know, I'm very grateful. Having had the experience of the last Parliament, this is yeah. uh, really quite wonderful. Uh, we are yeah, getting things done, and there is progress, and we have, I think, made a difference. Because we can make suggestions about things that we want to see done, uh, and 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 we can in fact make things happen, and we have. So so you know that um, the the committee can be a very effective oversight tool. Yeah. But it doesn't fix the fundamental <laughs> problems in the system. It doesn't fix the fact that the courts don't sit for longer than an hour and ten minutes a day if you're lucky. The committee can't fix that. We can make suggestions. We can ask questions. We can't make it happen. For that, mm -hmm. you need proper leadership, and, and there's a vacuum there. It doesn't fix the fact that the police are completely dysfunctional, totally under-resourced, 
and have no experienced policemen really in the biggest scheme of things to speak of and prosecutors are only as good as the case the police bring them and and that needs to be fixed that the, that that the committee can't fix mm. i think we all know what the nature of the problems are and i think we all have a pretty good idea how to fix them but it's not within our purview to do so uh, so and, and all i think will probably agree with me yeah um, yeah so there are a lot of things that we would like to see happen. We can't make them happen, uh, but we, we know that they should happen. And I'm sure David has a, a huge amount of suggestions about how to fix the police, a, a, as do I. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, as an oversight mechanism, I think we function exceptionally well. Would the criminal justice system be in a worse position without uh, an effective committee? Yes, it would. No question. Um, yeah. But can we fix all the flaws in the system? Uh, no, that requires uh, political leadership, and and in in all three departments, I'm afraid, correctional services, uh, justice, and um, and the police, there is a vacuum there. Uh, and in fairness, um, although I don't think that the Minister of Justice has done a fantastic job, uh, in fairness, it's a massive department which requires a huge amount of work, and uh, and it has gone backwards under his stewardship, but. But he inherited a, you know, a lame horse, uh, and so to fix it is going to take more than one man and more than one term. Yeah. No, thank you for that, Clinis. I think those are quite important points. Well, I mean, one of the points that Clinis raises here is that the committee itself is only made up of eleven members, and then you've had to create subcommittees. Can you just talk us through what informs the resource allocation in Parliament itself? Because from what I'm hearing, this is the one committee whose portfolio of entities to oversee is probably a lot more than what a committee like that oversees National Treasury, for example, will have to deal with, or the Standing Committee on the Auditor General, which seem to have a much no more narrower mandate. Is it then the responsibility of Parliament to say, wait, hold on, it looks like the portfolio of responsibilities here is vast enough for, say, for us to say we need either alternative committees or a much wider committee that then enables you guys to then say, over a course of a year, you've interrogated or you've interacted with as many of these portfolio entities as possible, and you feel that you've covered the ground. Uh, thank you, Kaya. I think uh, let me let me touch on a very important thing that uh, Advocate Brennan spoke about. Uh, particularly is that uh, we are a committee that is made up of different political parties, and uh, I, I agree with her hundred percent that. Uh, we have since established a cordial relationship uh, so that uh, we are able to equally contribute in the effectiveness of the work of the committee. And I agree with her fully that uh, we, we we have achieved that. The, we don't play politics there. I mean, I mean, someone would expect that uh, I'm a member of the ANC, I'm deployed by the ANC in parliament. The minister Lamola is a member of the ANC. Someone would expect that uh, there would be a bit of me trying to uh, 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 pro uh, protect and do all those funny things, but uh, Advocate B knows that uh, at some point we have chased him out out in a meeting when they were not ready to 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 present their report. So that, that's how cordial we are. Look, uh, the, the the issue of 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 the budgeting. One, I think, uh, let let us all agree that uh, we have faced a very difficult period of. Uh, an economy that is not growing at the rate as as expected and uh, affected by a number of factors uh, you can count a lot of them load shedding and uh, 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 COVID and all those things so we have experienced for a greater part of uh, our term a a period of budget cuts where budget uh, is cut uh, the other financial year, uh, this uh, entity was given 10, uh, 10 rands and uh, the next financial year, the outer, the outer years, they are given a lesser amount. And that is that is affected their own effectiveness in terms of uh, working and ensuring that uh, the, their mandate is fulfilled. But part of what we have been doing and monitoring properly is that when they come to report to us, we're able to, to mitigate for their own additional allowances because uh, i mean you, you can't you can't fight criminality without any resource it, it's 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 completely not possible it's natural not possible and your ability to fight against injustice 
is actually dependent to the kind of financial uh, or, or resource muscle that you have. So, so, so uh, until thus far, we've been able to negotiate for, for about um, uh, some few entities for an additional amount in the medium uh, term expenditure framework. Uh, uh, we have tried to do that. Uh, that. That's the kind of committee that we are. But as, as time goes, I think the issue of budgeting needs to be looked at. You, you have uh, another thing that I think we'll discuss one other, one other time, uh, Kaya, is the issue of the, the donations uh, done by the NPA, which are as a result of the financial problem that the country is facing. So, so we, we really are capable to do the work, but to a certain limited extent because of some uh, financial and budgeting uh, uh, problems that we face from time to time. But we, we, we have been able to uh, watch and uh, and uh, and uh, oversight the Department of Justice. For example, we have had the uh, Comrade Berenbach uh, would would recall that we have had a is an issue with the state attorney where there was a rampart corruption, there was a messy administration, there was a lot of problems, and we have uh, 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 instructed the minister to make uh, serious interventions to turn around the situation, and uh, he has uh, appointed uh, uh, Pandelani as the Solicitor General to turn around the state attorney. So that's the work that we have been doing and we've been able to win some of the things and not win some of them. And it is true that uh, ours is to oversight in terms of the constitution. Ours is to, is to ensure that there's public participation. Ours is to ensure that we enact laws. We can't go and do it on our, on our, on our, from, from the, the palm of our own hands. The letters that we've been fighting about with them Department of Justice, the issue of the recording, quarter recording machines. Uh, we, we fought with them, and as a result, there is an improvement now because of the, the level of intervention the committee has been making in ensuring that there's accountability and th there is work being done on behalf of the people of South Africa. Uh, but I yeah. think, uh, okay, so I, I know I, I talk too much. So. No, 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 there was still that question of the resource allocation between the committee itself, given the, na the nature of entities that it needs to oversee. Is this something that needs to be looked at different in order to ensure that, you know, you can do proper oversight across all the entities? Yes, most definitely. Uh, most definitely. Uh, actually, in considering the needs of all these entities, uh, you, you can't, uh, for example, you can't... Uh, uh, put uh, the Human Rights Commission and the NPA on the same wavelength in terms of uh, resourcing them, was there is more work on the other side and there is less work on the other side. So it's something really that we need to look at. It's something that Parliament needs to have a serious debate and discussion around, even if, if it's a, during the budget votes, discussions, uh, many plenaries and all the stuff. It's something that we need to look at because our ability to deliver justice to the people of South Africa is actually dependent to the ability of our own resource uh, muscle. So I agree. Uh, uh, my answer is yes. It's something that needs to be looked at. Thank you. No, thank you. David, I mean... I, I just Before you go to David, I just wanted to sort of jump in quickly and then I'll disappear again. Is yeah. Also, what, I, what I'm hearing from, from Paula and from Glynis is it's not a question that there should be more people because then you start be having a committee that's so large it becomes unmanageable almost and then you have to have a committee to manage the committee and i mean my understanding of the oversights committee is they're not there to replace the functions of the department it's just oversight but you but they do need other resources and i've noticed that that you know that what maybe that's something we can discuss in future at a different session is what are the kind of resources that would help the oversight committee you know, with its work, but but I think making it larger, it sounds like we just turn it into a, a committee of committees, and that might that might lessen the impact of what seems to be a really. I'm very actually pleased to hear how functional it is now because I have heard before in the past that you know that it was less uh, coherent, and and what what Linus was saying about uh, the excellent stewardship and the nonpartisanship is extremely heartening to hear. So I just wanted to add that, and I'll I'll shush now, and then you can move on to David. Sorry. No, thank you very much, Doctor. David, I want to come to you now with the difficult question of resource allocation, because obviously we do know that this particular cluster in particular deals with one of South Africa's greatest problems in that we do have a serious problem with crime and criminality. So when one then looks at the budget that the minister is going to table next month, for example, and then you hear there's a couple of billions here, 
what informs that is it simply a matter of national treasury, treasury saying that this is what we have and you guys must make do with it or is there a process that then says wait hold on what is it that we try to address what is it that these departments are required to do so therefore let's give them the requisite resources in order to execute on their mandate have we got that right right well i think that's an interesting question um and um insofar as i'm in a position to to really answer that i, I mean i confess to not being really familiar with the internal processes of the treasury and um how that is um you know how these issues are negotiated with the different departments i think um obviously that there's continuous pressure across the board from government part, uh, departments for um uh for their their budgets to be um increased though you know one of the <clears throat> one of the fa fa factors that might mitigate it uh mitigate against the treasury considering an increase in a budget is of course uh, under expenditure on a budget and i think there is quite frequently evidence of that of one kind or another um more generally you know uh, you know what 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 has been of interest to us has been um you know the the, the evidence that um that, that that for instance particularly if you're focusing on policing um there have been systematic investments in um increasing uh the financial investment in policing um over quite a sustained period though they have i mean uh, you know in recent years there has been an increasing awareness from government of uh its own financial constraints and so it's no longer the case that um the police can look forward to um you know uh, increases in their budget but those increases have not been accompanied by improvements in the effectiveness of the police so over much of the period while the budgets have been increasing um you know if you look across various indicators such as detect detection rates or you know in, I, i mean it is a controversial point itself but as to whether one should use levels of crime as a means of assessing the police because it's not only uh, dependent on the police as to where the crime goes up or down but nevertheless um you know for instance um south africa has had a murder rate which is uh, a per capita murder rate which has been increasingly steadily for something like 10 or 11 years and during much of that time the police budget was increasing so again you know the, it goes back to um you know quite profound questions about um uh the, the, you know well you know as i would frame it questions about uh, uh, you know general questions at, at some levels uh, general questions about the functioning of the state machinery but then you know one can also get spe into specifics and so for instance i raised the question of of the political leadership that is being provided to the police and you know i would say that 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 there it has been one of the systematic weaknesses of our criminal justice system has been um you know the political leadership of the police we have never seen the type of political leadership that we actually do need if we are going to um address crime corruption etc in a pur purposeful way um from from a policing perspective yeah david i think also in light of declining public resources we definitely need to get more value out of every rand that we spend them and i think the question of efficiencies becomes quite important then so from the research that you guys have seen over the past decade or so is there an understanding from the state that efficiencies must drive the way things are done and also when you look at the policing for example is this simply as a result of perhaps the wrong model for training the police to deal with the type of issues that we have here where we getting it wrong Well you see I mean th th there's all kinds of answers to your question but the one you know thing is to look at the kinds of decisions that are being made and how they're being motivated for and so if we're looking at something like the the the, the policing budget um and so for instance there were, you know over the last year or so there has been uh, this kind of investment in ex uh, um in, in expanding the number of police now in all cases where you know it's not that i would argue that we don't need more police but um you know what what i would look for is that the the motivation for that investment you know be 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 uh, that that a solid motivation be provided and so you know if we look at the the types of things that are being talked about 
we have the, the minister continuously talking about the issue of police visibility. Now, actually, it's, you know, it's pipe dream to talk about the SAPS as a, you know, national policing institution providing a role, uh, you know, fulfilling a role of providing police visibility. And, you know, and so, you know, and, and in fact, um, you know, there's actually very little evidence that investing on in police visibility on its own um, is anything that's going to make a particular difference to levels of crime. There is, um, you know, there is a, a role that certain types of visibility can play, you know, and I, I could get into that. But, um, you know, so, so another thing that's been motivated for um, has been the expansion of public order policing. And so in 2014, and uh, when Ria Piego was the National Commissioner of the SAPS, there was um, a presentation provided to Parliament, which gave a figure of something like 10,000 members that were, um, you know, said that, 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 that there was a shortfall in the number of public order police and that, um, you know, and, 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 that, um, and that there was a kind of optimum number of 10,000 that needed to be, um, you know, that the SAPS needed to meet in order to provide effective uh, public order policing. And so what you had was the July 2021 unrest. Yep. You haven't actually had um, proper analysis from government of the police response to that, that unrest, particularly there was quite a, a vaguely worded um, uh, recommendation from the expert panel on um, on the July unrest about um, improving uh, resourcing of public order policing. I can't remember the exact wording, but but you know it, it didn't go into the specifics. And you know if, if there was proper political leadership and proper consideration being given to issues of policy, um, you know one would have looked at you know how can we strengthen our public order policing capacity. In in a in a in, you know in an optimal way, considering the the constraints on resources that we are facing, but um, you know what we've done is simply as a knee jerk reaction to um, the, the the July twenty twenty one unrest, we've thrown you know a, an additional however many um, it probably runs into billions of brands in at, at recruiting four thousand um, new um, public order policing members. Um, and, you know, and actually that is likely to be wasteful expenditure. So you need to have a certain type of, um, you know, decision making and policy consideration at the senior leadership level, at the executive level, in order for, you know, the, the, the money that is being used to be, you know, used in an optimal way. And right at the moment, it simply isn't happening. Yeah, and I suspect that in some cases, new policy orientation frameworks come with more expenses and everyone just says, let us re let us retreat and stick to what we have, which is unfortunate. And I think also, David, the Fulham Commission would have made some important recommendations about public order policing. And yet when we got to July 2021, clearly not much had been learned in relation to that. Well, you see, you know, um, the, the, the Fulham Commission was focused on the Americana massacre. And on, so for instance, the issue, you know, questions like the issue of the use of the R5 and so on. There were more general recommendations. Um, and so for instance, there's a general recommendation on professionalization and demilitarization. And so, you know, the one critical question is for instance, there is this, what is it, a discussion document? I think I've got it just here. The national frameworks towards the professionalization of the public sector. And, you know, and so, you know, which cuts across, um, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the entirety of government, but, you know, desperately needs to be um, taken into serious consideration. And, you know, there needs to be a framework for implementing something like that in relation to the SAPS. And so, you know, there's, but, but, but that's a, it's a difficult process, firstly, on a political level, for for um, uh, you know uh, for uh, government to 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 drive and so you've got factors such as the fact that um, a, a very strong component of the support for the governing party the ruling party comes from within the public sector unions 
And so, you know, potentially you've got a constituency that is probably at best ambivalent about, um, you know, this type of framework. And so, um, you know, there are quite profound questions about how we are actually going to move forward with, with, yeah. with, with addressing these challenges. Okay. Thanks, David. Uh, Dr. Brody, any comments from you? Thanks. I wanted to kind of ask at this point, something that David raised also is that matching of a, a sort of a metric that gets put somewhere either in a, a public statement, a press release, or sometimes in an annual report or a budget report, and matching that to an actual outcome, um, and how difficult that is. And, and something that struck me again, reviewing the various annual reports and budget documents from the different departments, um, was how difficult it is to actually read all of these things. And I know that the budget votes are presented in, I suppose, to maybe to accountants, it looks like, you know, Harry Potter reading. It's all kind of mm. lovely. You can sit and have a cup of tea and it's pleasurable. But for most people, reading those kind of documents is, is not that fun. And it takes a while to sort of figure out where the important information is. But particularly, I found that the language and the ordering of information between departments is always quite different um, and inconsistent between years. And that makes it really hard to, to figure out where do I find the information that I need to know, because it does strike me all this information is public. You know, you can find it on a website, you can download it. But it's kind of like there's invisible ink or, or there's hidden text yeah. <laughs> and, and it's just hard to figure it out. So when I read sort of correctional services, for example, and they explain, um, you know, an overspending or underspending or something to do with particularly fruitless and wasteful expenditure, it's phrased in such a way that I can't even understand what they're saying. And this is literally my job is to understand these narratives and I'm struggling. So I, I wanted to ask maybe, maybe our, our two MPs, but you know, if there's a sense that sometimes it's made impossible to understand so that we can't actually ask questions about it. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to answer that. I'll start with you. Oh. Yes, I think it's on. It's done uh, absolutely on purpose. Um, all of the things that are, are wanting to be hidden, fruitless and wasteful expenditure, um, other kinds of... Um, uh, unauthorized expenditure, all of, in, in fact, the budgets are written, the entire budget is written in a way that it, it, it's, it's, it's really the pinnacle of obfuscation and makes it impossible unless you have somebody who really knows what they're doing uh, to interpret it for you. It's impossible to make head or tail out of what's actually going on in the budget. And as, uh, as Nahama says, from one year to the next, it's not reported in a consistent fashion. So you may have a handle on something this year. Next year, it's dressed up in a completely different way. And uh, unless you're able to actually track it down or find it, you'd, you'd never know what had become of your issue. Uh, and I believe that that's done, A, on purpose, uh, to, to hide the detail that, that nobody wants to uh, shine a light on. But B, it's also done... I think possibly because there's no um, – the staff turnover is so high that whoever prepares the budget this year is not the same person who prepares it next year. Yeah. And, and, and there's no uh, uniformity or conformity in how it must be prepared. And so you'd get a budget from uh, the NPA this year that looks – Completely different to the budget from last year. Uh, correctional services, I mean, you have to go and hunt. I have to go and hunt, really, and, and get some help. Because uh, unlike you, you know, figures are not easy for me. I see you in Lola, I won't be long. Uh, <laughs> you have to, in fact, go and hunt to find what money they spend, for instance, in correctional services on rehabilitation. Yeah. It's their biggest program. It's what they have to do. But, you know... Bugger me if you can find it. So yeah. it's, a, it's a big problem. Dennis, just as a follow up on that, I mean, as parliamentary oversight committees, are you not then in a position to say, guys, in order for us to actually know what it is that we're deliberating on, here's the preferred format for presenting the information. These are the focus areas where we'd like to know what the resource allocation is and how you measure those. Or is it something that simply says, well, the executive prepares these reports in a way that they best fit and you as um, a lawmaker simply have to work with what you have. What is the process there? No, no, we have now uh, started telling them how we want it presented and what we want to see. 
So what, what, where our interest lies, what the issues are that we want to be able to interrogate, and how we expect those, um, the, 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 that information to be presented to us in a fashion that isn't uh, a masterclass in obfuscation. Okay. It sounds like there's progress there. Ola, what are your views on that? Are we getting it right, finally? No, uh, Advocate D will recall that uh, in the committee we have established a culture mm. uh, that when a department or an entity is going to come and present whatever report to the committee, they must send us the report seven days before the actual meeting. It, it actually helps the committee members to, to be able to acquaint themselves with the report and actually note what... Uh, is, is actually not going right. But two, we always receive a research document before the actual committee meeting that uh, this is what they've raised in the past uh, uh, financial year. This is what they are raising now. It always brings us closer to the most important issues regarding that budget uh, uh, report. So it, it helps us as a committee to be able to exercise our, 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 our oversight responsibility effectively. But where I think uh, it, it may be challenging is, is, is the public understanding that in the format at which this report has been uh, uh, submitted, understanding the actual uh, Africa. So, so otherwise, from, from the committee side of, of things, we, we are always advantaged because we've got a group of uh, capable researchers that are able to point out that if uh, you, you bring us a, a, a plagiarized report, they are able to note it out. So when you arrive, we, we move you proper. Mm -hmm. uh, if you bring us um, a, a, a copy and paste kind of a report, what they are able to check it uh, in time before the actual meeting and we are going to global you proper. So I think uh, the format may be challenging to the members of the public as uh, 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 your co-host was saying, it, it may be challenging for them, but this is where the importance of the Auditor General actually is important. It, is, it comes uh, to the play because they are able to note the fruitless, wasteful expenditure and all those things. And uh, the good about it is that to, to make government accountable to the people, the Auditor General goes to the public and say, in this municipality, this is what we have found. In this entity, this is what we have found. In this department, this is what is found. And they have consistently, year by year, been going to the public and doing that uh, that uh, that address so that our people across the country are able to understand in a very simple way that these are the problems the public sector is facing. And this is what as Auditor General think that these are, must be attended to. So, so, so I think, I think as much as we've got the, those challenges, but there are systems in place to ensure that uh, we're able to attend to them properly. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, when you talk about access and accessibility of information, it's obviously very important for us to ensure that all of these documents can be synthesized by the general public. And I think, as it turns out, the media plays a very critical role in sort of trying to translate some of this information onto what, you know, citizens can then engage and digest in. So my query is whether we even have the right models to enable members and practitioners of the media to actually understand what these reports are about. I think in the case of the Auditor General, obviously the great limitation is that they come after the fact. So they can tell you that what has gone wrong, but perhaps if we had the same tools of interrogation at a point in time when the budget is presented, at a point in time when the budget vote is presented where people can say, no, no, it doesn't make sense that you're planning on spending an additional rent there when there's no issue there, you're ignoring the key issue here. That might actually make the, the process of, you know, citizen engagement, if nothing else, a bit more proactive and a bit more, uh, you, you, you know, a, a deepen. Is this something that we could potentially get to? The, the meetings of, of, of parliament are all um, uh, public. Mm. Uh, the media, the public uh, has got uh, access to those meetings so that they better understand what is actually happening. And I think uh, since 2019, when I joined parliament, uh, in our meetings, the media has always been there uh, to, to be able to uh, report and alert the members of the public of what is happening. Uh, you know, a point, a point in case, 
uh, is when on the international relations we established uh, that uh, the, there was money that was uh, used, uh, 118 million to buy a, a an embassy in, in, in the New in York United States. Mm -hmm. Yes. So so is, the, is, is that committee that was able to relay that information properly so that the public understands what is actually happening. So from where I'm seated, I think the public has got um, a, an access to every information uh, that parliament uh, engages on, even if it's a sitting, even if it's a mini plenary, even if it's a committee meeting, including the subcommittees, the subcommittees that I spoke about of course, child services. So they, they have been of useful uh, a value to us in relaying such kind of information and decisions that we take as committees of parliament to the public so that the public understands and uh, from what i've been i've been following uh, kaya uh, uh, the, the media has helped us to simplify what we're dealing with in 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 in, in the parliament precinct so so they have been getting that access accessible uh, but i think we can uh, improve on on ensuring that uh, there is a simple understanding of the reports, particularly on budget, uh, such that we can we can even relay those um, or, or reprint those reports into different official languages, so that our people are able to to uh, to have a a classic understanding of what is actually happening in terms of uh, the public finance. But uh, uh, of course, it's something that uh, we, may, we we are still discussing. Uh, that will need uh, in itself some resourcing. Uh, <laughs> printing a number of uh, uh, reports in 11 different languages for the entire country uh, would come expensive. But I think budget, I mean, uh, government must be able to work around that. So that Eastern Cape. Umdosengobo would not understand these things of wasteful expenditure, uh, fruitless and what what. And they wouldn't want even grasp the difference between the two. So, yeah, so, yeah. so uh, hence, hence, hence the, the, the important need, to, the significant need for us to ensure that we relay this information in a language that our people are going to better understand it so that they actively participate on the government systems and the government processes. Thank you very much. No, thank you. David, I mean, as a, as a research institution, I imagine you engage with a lot of these reports in the dense form that they're in. Are we seeing any particular improvement in how accessible they've become? Or is it still one of those particular tools that makes it very difficult for us to objectively assess the performance of the leaders of, of institutions like the police force, like correctional services? Is this something that South Africa needs to do better in order to ensure that citizens can say, wait, hold on, even before I call the Institute for Security Studies, I can understand what the problem is here. Right. Well, you see, I, I, I think uh, one of the issues that was raised is just that um, there's sometimes the inconsistency in reporting that um, from one year to the next, um, there, um, you know, there, there might be a difference in the categories that are used or data is provided in one year and then isn't provided in the next year and so on. My general gripe um, is r rather of, in some ways, the opposite, goes in the opposite direction. I mean, I can sympathize to some degree with the, with the point about shifts in, um, you know, the categories that are used and things like that, or data that is provided over like two or three years. And then, you know, and then, for instance, the SAPS will stop providing it. But to some degree, what, you know, the dominant feature of all of this is, um, it, what, what the SAPS itself is, it provides a, a very high volume of information on the one hand. And it provides information in, a, uh, in a, what, what, what did you call it, a, a, a kind of very standard, standardized format to a large degree. So in some ways, what you know, seems to be happening in many years is that the same, almost, you know, the same, not, not just the same template, but almost the same language is used in, um, you know, and then, you know, and then there's, you know, uh, uh, and, and so then, you know, various types of information are provided, but where it all falls short is in terms of, uh, you know, co coherent, you know, which would, I, you know, again, you know, to, and not that I want to over uh, labor the point, but, you know, we'd start with, clear and coherent policy. What are our priorities? Or do we have a co coherent set of priorities? And to what degree can we say that we are actually responding to those priorities? To what degree 
you know, what, what adjustments have we made um, to, you know, in order to, to better respond or to the priorities that we, we are talking about? Are our priorities important, uh, appropriate, considering the overall picture and things like that? So at the level of analysis, there's a large, you know, there's a large volume of information that's being provided, um, but it's very much in a very kind of standardized way without any real, you know, uh, engagement from year to year on, you know, moving any particular agenda forward. You know, how have we moved, you know, what's also characteristic of these uh, reports is that they compare, you know, they, they, they will provide data on, a particular issue where there might it might be arrest or any one of a, a you know a hundred or thousand other things and they'll compare it with the previous year but you know, will you get uh, you know data looking at um trends over the last five or ten years you know generally not and so you know the the, the picture that you getting provided for with is not actually one which lends itself to actual analysis and so again, this to me goes back to an issue of pro professionalization that, you know, one can um, uh, uh, impose higher demands on these government departments to, you know, improve the quality of information that they're providing. But do they actually have, um, you know, the, 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 the capacity to improve, you know, provide a better quality of, of, of analysis so that we can, you know, get into a proper conversation rather than you know, for instance, the Minister of Police each each time he presents the statistics will, you know, you know, and I've been listening to these things for a long time. And, you know, characteristically, it's the same things that are repeated again and again and again. The same, you know, standardized explanations for what's going on as if there is no forward movement in how we are understanding things. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, part of, you know, one of the questions, because you know, we're talking about where we invest our resources, how how we improve um, the effectiveness of the, the, the resources that we are investing, you know, and um, it's, you know, if you speak to researchers, of which I'm one, they'll always want better research. So, but, you know, you know, but it's a, it's a fair policy question is, how can we improve, uh, you know, the capacity, and I'm talking particularly within the policing sector, so that we are actually getting, um, you know, um, engaging with the, the the massive and complex challenges that we're facing in in a, in a much more kind of purposeful way. Um, Thank you. Kaya, can I, I want to just ask that anyone, the audience that's with us and people are sending you messages as well, anybody who wants to pose questions for the panelists, if they can start posting them now, because otherwise we'll run out of time at the end. Um, but I also, in terms of what David was saying, that sort of um, the, you know, the allocate, the, that understanding of, of linking the required outcome, something as well that became quite clear to me, you know, every annual report, every department report has its own um, performance targets. And I feel yeah. like, they, I feel like they set their own performance targets um, in a way that is achievable for them. I feel like they they choose performance targets in a way that they can meet them, but that don't make sense to people on the outside. How am I supposed to actually see if there is progress in prisons, police, and court based on performance targets that, that feel like, to be honest, ChatGPT could have written them sometimes. They are so obscure, they, they really don't seem to make sense. Um, so I was like, are, you know, especially for the people who are reading lots of budgets, is our performance targets too low? Um, are they actually relevant? And, and um, because all we can see in a budget is sort of financial line items, and the explanation is often very thin. Um, you know, Glynis was saying something earlier about rehabilitation services in, in correctional services. And I would like to maybe just have a quick focus on there because there has been a lot about prisons recently, um, you know, not only with Tabo Besta, who may have been the only person in the country that actually had a glamorous prison experience, you know, because everybody else I've spoken to who's incarcerated has an absolutely awful time, um, barring few exceptions. When I was looking through the numbers, the the page in the police and sorry correctional services report on nutrition is it's literally two pages long it it tells me that they have met all of their targets right <clears throat> for providing nutritional services but when i analyze their budget based on the number of reported prisoners what i worked out maybe Cola and glennis you you will correct me if this is wrong but based on the numbers provided 
The state, we have about 143 to 150,000 prisoners. We spend 23 rand a day on feeding them. Now, 23 rand for three meals that are supposed to provide like nutrition. So, so for me, that was useful, but also what was really obvious was that the performance targets of we have met all our targets seem to have no correlation with spending 23. That's less than what's that? Eight rand a meal, you know, eight yeah, rand a yeah, meal. Eight. I don't even know how that's possible to feed like an adult male who's the majority of the prison population. I, you know, I don't know how that's possible. So there's lots of missing information and the performance targets I feel are very low. Like it's like your mother setting up, you know, putting a hurdle. Don't worry, my love, you can jump over this, but it's only kind of three centimeters high. Our performance targets seem to be too low and our metrics are, are terrifying. Um, so I don't know if, if we can maybe just in the correctional services area in particular, have a discussion around that. Yeah. If we can start with that, Glynis, and also perhaps the question of do committees like yours have the capacity to interrogate and push back against some of these numbers that get presented there? Because in some of them, it does look just a bit weird what the allocation of resource is versus what the targets are and versus what everybody understands the objective and the mandate of the department needs to be. Um, yeah, sure. So there are, there's a variety of... of um, performance targets that are nonsensical in my view and that are not helpful and that tell us absolutely nothing and that again is by design. Um, and I'll get to correctional services in a moment because I know that's uh, what Nakama really asked about. But, you know, for instance, the National Prosecuting Authority uh, presents um, a conviction rate as a percentage. So they have a they have a 92% conviction rate. Well, what does that mean? Um, if you if you do one case a year and you win it, then you've got a hundred percent conviction rate. Mm. Uh, it means absolutely nothing if you don't know if you don't track uh, crimes committed, cases reported to the police, dockets handed to the prosecuting authority, cases enrolled, cases finalised. You you don't know anything. So to report that as a percentage is my annual beef with them. And, and it continues to be my annual beef for them, and we haven't made a lot of progress in getting that changed. Um, it means nothing. I have an, a 92% conviction rate. So what did I, I lose? 0.8 of a case. What, what does it mean? Mm. You, you know. So and <clears throat> correctional services as well. Um, th there's a lot of stuff hidden away in in line items, and and a lot of stuff that's not reported on because they don't want to report on it uh, with, across the entire criminal justice system. The police as well. A lot of stuff is not reported on because it's not convenient to report on because it doesn't demonstrate any kind of progress, doesn't demonstrate any kind of success. Um, so, you know, both both those departments, even correctional services, correctional services has a massive budget. It really does. It has a huge, huge budget. But most of its budget is spent on uh, uh, paying um, wardens, you know, on salaries. The, the 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 major part of the correctional services budget goes to to salaries. So um, you know, can you feed grown men on twenty three bucks a day? No, I, I don't think that you can feed them properly on twenty three bucks a day. Uh, I know that Nana spends a lot more than twenty three bucks a day on his lunch. Um, that's why he's such a handsome young man. And uh, and you can't you can't um, feed anybody a nutritious meal on on twenty three bucks a day. It's just not possible. Uh, but correctional services does have a very big budget and used more carefully, used more wisely, more, used more efficiently, you could achieve a, a, a lot more because, you know, prisons work where prisoners work and prisoners can contribute a huge amount um, to their own, to, to maintaining buildings, to to cooking food, to, to learning skills, carpentry, plumbing, electrical work. Uh, in in upskilling um prisoners so that they, when they leave, they have been rehabilitated and they can contribute to the economy and they're actually able to employ themselves because it's really hard to get a job when you leave prison. I mean, are you going to employ somebody who's just left prison? I, I, I did once and it didn't work out well. Um, so, so, you know, generally people struggle to find a job, understandably, when they come out of prison. And so you need to place them in position of skills that enable them to actually earn a living. Otherwise, you get what we've got. The highest recidivism rate in the world, and and while we while we're there, let, allow me a, a quick private beef. 
about uh, the Minister of Justice just or, or the President, bless him, just releasing on uh, unsuspecting citizens uh, nine and a half thousand plus prisoners, and a whole lot of them have now been released. They've been dumped on the streets. They've got no kind of support system. Uh, correctional uh, services, uh, uh, community corrections can't deal with them because they themselves are so under resourced and no provision was made. And just down the road from my house here in Cape Town, a whole lot of them were dumped on the street corner. I spoke to them yesterday. No support, nowhere to go, no way to integrate into their communities, no way of looking after themselves. What's going to happen? They're going to commit crimes. What, they don't have a choice. And so as long well, as we keep treating tragic, yeah. people like that, as long as we keep treating people like that, we're going to get what we've got. And nobody's... Dysfunctional to, system. Yeah, it's a dysfunctional system. It needs to be redesigned, overhauled, and 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 rebuilt to, to, to you know, have some sort of purpose. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't. The criminal justice system as a whole needs to be uh, re-overhauled. The... The, the the court systems, the National Prosecuting Authority, they, they have perennially too low a budget. They are under-resourced both financially and otherwise. But again, yeah. they're, not, they're not using their resources optimally. They have all those prosecutors that are being paid. The courts are there. The buildings exist. The judiciary and the magistracy are there. The interpreters are there. The police are there. Yet the courts sit for an hour and 10 minutes a day. Now, how much work are you going to get done? What will happen to you if you go to work for an hour and 10 minutes a day? Not much. Not much work. To not, me. Much, not much. In the not work much. Work. Yeah. Uh, if my committee only sat for an hour and 10 minutes a day, I can tell you right now, Bulalani would have a stroke and we'd get no work done. So it's it, Bulalani you know, gratitude, not Bulalani Nuka. Uh, thanks for that, Glennis. We have a question for you, Tola, and this is a question from one of our audience members. And the question is How can journalists do more to explain justice processes to audiences in non urban areas and also in languages other than English? Okay, before that, just, just, just a quick, a quick important thing. Uh, one, the issue of uh, targets set. Hmm. The advantage of the research document is that it takes us three years back. That in regard to this uh, uh, issue, this is the target they have set, uh, and uh, this is how they have performed. So uh, we always are able to, to 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 juggle in on on what may be the reason for a target that is lower than the last uh, financial year. So we deal with that. The issue on correctional services. Uh, it, 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 it's 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 expensive. Running prisons is is generally expensive. Hence, uh, you have had uh, the the public uh, private partnerships kind of an arrangement that started, I think, in ninety nine or two thousand, where you have got a uh, privately run uh, 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 prisons or uh, correctional centers, uh, including the Mangaung one. You remember the Tabo yeah. best one? Uh, was the unfortunate uh, one. Was, yeah, the unfortunate one. They, they were not so proud about it. Uh, so. It's part of the measures by government to ensure that at least we contain the the the, the cost of how we 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 administer and take care of prisoners. But most importantly, Kaya, is that correctional services have got, have got what they call self sufficiency program. A self sufficiency program where they've got their own internal projects. You've got suing. They they do baking and um, and say when we go to oversight in all these prisons we always find there's a project that is being done. Uh, they, they 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 do finisher uh, where we have even encouraged government departments to buy finisher from correctional services. They mm -hmm. they run their own farms. They produce their own crops and animals. So so it actually helps the cost. Uh, uh, as the co-host was saying, it it helps the cost of. Uh, how how these prisons are are, are run and administered? Uh, I think it's something that a, we, government needs to invest more time and energy on the self sufficiency program, particularly like during this time of an an uneven economic situation. Uh, uh, lastly, I think uh, from from what I have I've watched in terms of the role journalists must play, uh, they, they they have been actually uh, playing a very good role. But uh, we've 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 only experienced it in the big high-profile cases, where journalists are on the ground. They are playing an effective role of uh, informing the public of what is happening in respect of this of, of this uh, 
of this um, uh, uh, trial or case or whatever. Mm. We know all the <laughs> cases, your sense of Meiwa and all that. It's always on TV. Uh, 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 we, we, we get to understand as the public that uh, th this is what is happening. And we get that information through those journalists. I think they are doing a great job. How do we then improve it? Because we, we, we have got courts in outskirts. Uh, where no one really uh, draws an, 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 an interest in a particular trial and all that. I think the best we can do is to even utilize the community radio stations to be able to, 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 to disseminate the information from the, the, the court proceedings to the people in a language that is uh, 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 mostly understood by that kind of community. For example, where I come from, Engobo, there's been an establishment of a community radio station and mobile uh, community uh, radio, what, what. Now, they, they have been able at least to disseminate information as to the people of Ngoboba. A court, when they get a court, tell us this is what is happening and all those things. So the best role, as the question is asking, that uh, journalists must play is to ensure that we use even the the the, the lowest level of uh, the media apparatuses that we 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 have got access in to ensure that we communicate uh, uh, those uh, important messages and important information to the public in a language that is best understood by them. Uh, I, I I think I tried I tried to cover it. Thank you, thank you, Kaya. Yeah, thank you. And I think the question will always come down to the resources, the resource allocation, as you mentioned earlier on, the number of languages that we have versus, you know, the process of making sure that the right translators, for example, get that information. That's a key challenge that still exists. David, there's a question for you that says, visible policing makes up more than half of the police budget. If that is not the most effective means of crime fighting, what areas should we be uh, looking to invest in, rather? Hi. Um, okay, well, you know, I, I would be um, misleading you if I pretended that I had a... a straightforward or simple answer to that question. Um, so, you know, it's not that, um, firstly, let's clarify the point that, so so when we're talking about visible policing, we're talking about the, uh, to, you know, uh, to some degree, we're talking about the component of the SAPS that are uniformed. So the, 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 the term visible policing is um, in some ways synonymous with the term, uh, you know, uh, uniformed police members. So, um, for instance, uh, you know, detectives don't necessarily wear a police uniform and so on. And um, and so, you know, what, what what we're talking about, so, so, so um, you know, then is, you know, the, the first question then is not, so, you know, what, what my, my complaint was about was that, this component of the police, okay, the, the, the minister was saying that we need to beef up the, the, mem the number of members of the SABS in order to improve police visibility. And so, you know, the, the, the critical point here is that visibility, you know, it is not, um, it's not appropriate in a country South such as South Africa for the state to invest um, uh, in what are effectively, um, in relative terms, highly salaried members of the public um, in order merely to maintain visibility. One wants the, them to, you know, be responsible for something that is more, far more productive in reducing crime. And so, you know, some of the arguments here are around, for instance, um, you know, it's not um, for the you know for the the purpose of, of visibility in itself that one wants to maintain visible personnel, but one does want to improve one's use of something like targeted patrol and the the standard you know terminology um, currently in the policing wor world is about for instance crime hotspots and you know directed at co to and targeted patrol that is uh, you know uh, focused on addressing problems at uh, you know policing hotspots what that in turn requires is you know some investment in ensuring that um, police are uh, appropriately identifying hotspots and so on understanding you know what kind of hotspots it is productive to focus on and things like that 
So which again, you know, raises this question about um, potentially the needs to strengthen the, you know, information analysis capacity of the police in order to su support the better of uh, better use of those resources on the ground. Um, there's another, you know, British report that I was looking at, which was, you know, talking about, um, you know, saying that, you know, you know, also made this argument that visibility in itself is not a productive aim. That um, that what one needs from you know police members is for them to be engaged in um, you know engaging with members of the public. So again, you know, it might be uh, questions about resolving disputes between people, intervening in disputes, um, and it might also be a, you know a question about engagement in you know local problem solving and initiatives which is you know again uh, you know it's, it raises questions about the the type of skills that you would have you, you that you would need to have available to you in this visible policing co component so you know so so you know our uniformed police should not in effect be a type of glorified security guard um, yeah. backed up by the authority of the state but they, you know, they should be um, deployed for specific purposes, and then just right. beyond that to try and be very brief. But um, you know, there are obviously questions about um, the need for greater investment in the crime investigation function. Earlier on, I, I, I you know I raised a question about whether the um, investment in um, public order policing was appropriate, and whether you know th th there were areas of judgment that had been made there. So, you know, those are some of the questions that, that I would put on the table. Okay, now very important questions there. Unfortunately, I'm fast running out of time. And I think obviously the question of what these budgets are all about is a very complicated and very important one. And the better we understand what underpins them, the better we're able to interrogate them. Last question for you, Glynis, I'm going to come to you first. What would you like to see the media cover more or cover better in relation to these particular departments because clearly we understand the, the the need for South African citizens to have a better understanding of what happens and how it impacts them. Thanks, Kaya. Look, I think the media has done an outstanding job and uh, we owe them a huge debt of thanks because without them, uh, state capture would still be a secret. A whole lot of things would still be a secret. Um, without them, Tawa Bester would still be living in 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 Hyde Park, uh, living his best life, shopping at trucks. So you know, um, it's it's a the, the media has been great. Uh, I think the media probably needs um, also better resourcing. Investigative journalists, uh, you know, operate on a shoestring. Um, so so they they need to have uh, they need to be better resourced, and and you know we need to find a way of doing that, um, and then. You know, they'd be able to to do more reporting on the shortcomings in the criminal justice system as a whole, and thereby uh, sort of hanging it out there on the front page, so that citizens are aware of the shortcomings and that citizens are aware of their rights, so they can hold people to account. Citizens go to court, for instance. Well, let's take the master's office. The citizens get up at at three in the morning in Cape Town. I go there often just to ask them how long they've been standing there. Uh, citizen, old ladies, pregnant women, disabled people get up at three in the morning, catch two to three taxis, spend their entire social grant on getting to the master's office to access a document. They stand there from four in the morning in the freezing cold and rain in the hope that they will be one of the people that get let in the door today. They may not be. Them. I spoke to a gentleman the last time Ola, uh, we, when we went to the... Uh, to the to, to do oversight there. I spoke to a gentleman who'd been coming there for over nine years, and he still hadn't solved his problem. And that's no way to be treating citizens. That's not, you know, that, that, those services must be accessible. So I would like to see the press being able to hold those institute, all the institutions, including ourselves, to account uh, more effectively, so that citizens uh, generally become more aware of their rights and can hold us to account when their rights are, are trampled on like that. When you go to court, you summon to court, you go and sit there. Uh, you Also, you leave home at four in the morning because you've got to be there at eight and Lord knows you don't want to be late. And mm -hmm. the court doesn't start until 11. And when the prosecutor walks in, they ignore you. And this afternoon at three, your matter has been postponed and somebody says, okay, well, you can go now. We'll let you know when you must come back. 
how is that okay? It's not okay. And those things need to be reported on so that citizens know that it's not okay and they have a right to be treated better and then demand it. All right. Thanks, Glenis. Tola, last word from you. What should the media do better in order to cover this sector or is what the media is doing sufficient given the resource limitations we have? <laughs> Of course, Kaya, the media is doing a, a very important and a, and a big job. And a, a, I, must, I must concede here that the media is doing the best they can in terms of ensuring that uh, the public is aware of all these matters and how they are handled. Well, that's what is important. The, the public must, must actually know how are these matters uh, being handled by our justice system. I think uh, it it may it may actually be a resource problem. Remember, I said uh, uh, the focus must not only be on the high profile cases. Uh, we must be able to teach a particular uh, ordinary uh, um, uh, man in 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 the outskirts of uh, the rural areas that uh, uh, GBV is a punishable offence in accordance to law, and uh, how they must know is true. The media assisting us and ensuring that this information is uh, made to for is 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 made public for public consumption. Uh, I think the media is doing a great job. Of course, uh, it it may be limited uh, in terms of the resource and all those things. I think uh, government must be able to 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 look at that and ensure that uh, the Department of Communications uh, is able to get closer and work. Uh, 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 closer with the media to ensure that uh, it helps us disseminate that information. So some of the times the government is doing a great job, uh, but uh, society is not aware because uh, uh, that information has not been able to uh, has not been uh, shared with the public. So I think uh, the government, on its accord, must be able to assist the media where there are challenges in terms of covering what is happening in the country. Thank you very much. All right. No, thank you very much, Paula. Thank, thank you very much, David. Thank you Dave, very much, the clinics. I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Brody now. But I think a final yeah. word from me is that clearly there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in order to ensure that citizens can understand what all these numbers mean, what it translates to what happens within our communities. Because as we now know, we have a, crim a crime crisis, we've got a criminality crisis, and we're not seeing enough being done in order to address that. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Brody. Thanks so much. And I'm, yeah, I think we could keep on talking about this for quite a while, but I do have to end the seminar on time. And um, I'm hoping that we were more interesting than the plenary. Don't tell the president I said that, but I hope that we kept our MPs entertained. I really want to thank you, Kaya, so much for guiding this discussion and really to thank um, David for joining us and giving us great insights and just thoughtful comments about policing. Um, and to Tola, um, so, such a pleasure to meet you for the first time. I really know this won't be the last. I look forward to many discussions in the future. To Glynis, it's always lovely to talk to you again. And I think the lesson that I'm hearing here is, you know, once again, um, you know, when Gola says the, the government could do a better job in sort of sharing information about stories, it is a reminder to me that as journalists, our job is actually to go and find those stories and not to wait for the government to bring it to us. And, and that is about skilling up journalists and teaching new and old journalists how to ask the right questions with the right laws in place and an understanding of departments and budgets so that, you know, when we're put into situations where we are able to ask a politician or a prosecutor or a, a judge or a policeman questions, we know know what the right questions are to ask. So I think a lot more proactive work could be done on the journalism side. We can't wait for the state to bring us stories. We have to actually go out there into communities, to courtrooms, um, and to prisons ultimately, and, and find out what's going on. And hopefully the Vits Justice Project will be a, a part of that going forward. So we will end the webinar here. Um, everybody who's registered will be mailing you with information in the future. And just, again, have a wonderful and safe afternoon. Absolutely. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Absolutely. Okay. Brought it, sorry, I, I'm not interjecting. You know, we learned it from the media that there was a stage uh, escape by Tabo Pest. That's how important the media is to us. <laughs> totally. No, it is. It's it's it shouldn't be funny. You know, we are the weirdest country. The things that we laugh at, honestly, yeah. <laughs> we have to laugh. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good afternoon.